Uh, so, uh, so this is the tail end of the meeting, but I, uh, uh, so, so probably your concentration levels are on the win, but, uh, 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 but I'll, I'll, uh, the aim of my lectures is to actually uh, expose you to certain uh, uh, ideas which uh, I think uh, are important, and I'll give you a more of a broad brush overview of them. I'll, uh, except for maybe small uh, snatches, I will not go very deeply into uh, too many technical details. Uh, um, but I think the general ideas are very appealing, uh, and uh, and so uh, so hopefully I'll uh, I'll try to convey to you uh, uh, some of that and not tax you too much with uh, detailed calculations. Uh, so. Uh, Please stop me uh, any time in the middle as well. And of course, there's the discussion session. Uh, so uh, so you, uh, feel free to ask questions any time. So, uh, so the topic that I want to expose you a little to uh, is called uh, Mellon Amplitudes in, uh, uh, in Conformal Field Theory. Uh, uh, so I'll... Uh, and for perhaps many of you, this is an unfamiliar topic. Uh, so I'll I'll start with some motivation uh, uh, and uh, uh, of why uh, uh, this is uh, interesting, um, and then we'll sort of uh, uh, go deeper into the topic uh, by first uh, reminding you of some things, uh, uh, some properties of amplitudes in conformal field theory or correlation functions in conformal field theory and how they're conventionally represented in terms of cross ratio uh, and so on. And this will help us to sort of uh, uh, lead us into the Mellon representation, which is a sort of a, a special uh, way of representing these amplitudes. Uh, and um, after defining and uh, 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 this thing, we'll see why it's so interesting. Uh, we'll talk of some of the general properties of these uh, amplitudes. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll see that this is sort of the, the key reason why uh, I'm, uh, these general properties are so attractive, uh, so nice. Uh, that, uh, uh, so this is sort of the main reason to sort of study this. Uh, we'll then illustrate this uh, uh, general properties in a, in, uh, through some sample uh, computations and cases in perturbative CFTs, so perturbative conformal field theories. Uh, so in a sense, uh, in a uh, weak coupling expansion. Uh, uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, some computations in the opposite regime of if you wish, strong coupling, where they, whereas the CFTs have a representation in terms of uh, gr uh, amplitudes in antidesitor gravity uh, 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 theories. Uh, so, and then finally, sort of summarized with some outlook. Uh, uh, so, um, so that that's the plan. Uh, so, starting with the motivation. Let me uh, start with sort of two questions of fundamental importance, which I, I feel are, uh, uh, are very, uh, are contemporary questions of fundamental importance. Uh, uh, so the first is, uh, the first you can phrase as, are all large N CFTs, conformal field theories, uh, uh, satisfying some conditions, which I can specify maybe later, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some conditions, the small print. Uh, um, uh, are they identical to but a bit of string theories? So, uh, uh, so we have sort of a definition uh, of perturbative string theories uh, 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 in terms of some world sheet amplitudes. Uh, 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 is, uh, uh, 
are large NCFTs dual to sort of perturbative string theories on ADS, uh, uh, on antidecital uh, uh, space times, uh, because they would have to have the same isometries. Uh, 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 so, so, so this is a question I think many people believe the answer is yes, uh, that uh, if provided these conditions are sort of more sharply uh, uh, defined, uh, uh, um, there would be consistent, uh, uh, consistent unitary large N CFTs uh, would, would be dual to perturbative string theories uh, on ADS. Uh, so that's uh, one question that I think many people are interested in and certainly something that I find uh, uh, very important to answer. Uh, mm, uh, uh, and the second question is seemingly unrelated. Uh, uh, can we find um, sort of uh, efficient analytic techniques to uh, solve the bootstrap equation of CFTs. So you've had already a course from Slava Richkov about CFTs, their general properties, and in particular about the amazing progress that has been made on uh, uh, understanding properties of uh, CFTs in higher than two dimensions using these bootstrap techniques. Uh, a large number of the results, most of the results in this topic have been uh, uh, numerical uh, uh, results, uh, getting bounds uh, 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 on dimensions and OP coefficients uh, and so on. But, uh, 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 but in a sense, the uh, results demonstrate the power of the bootstrap equation already that uh, using such a sort of a um, uh, crude hammer you can already get uh, uh, get uh, a number of very interesting results so there are, is there a right right language or a right approach to try to make progress analytically and go beyond the sort of the numerical results which uh, of course, you can sort of push further ahead, uh, but uh, it's always a sort of a, uh, uh, it's not going to uh, ultimately uh, help you to fully solve the theory. Um, so, um, so these two questions, uh, uh, which um, look quite different, but uh, 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 perhaps there are even relations between them, but, uh, um, uh, but these two questions, I believe, can be addressed uh, in, uh, these are, an, this is an example of two questions that can be addressed using this sort of Mellon representation uh, of uh, CFT amplitudes. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so though I will not, uh, I, I will not uh, go very much into, uh, I mean, I won't be able to tell you how to solve these questions. Of course, these are, uh, uh, the, these are outstanding questions. Uh, but uh, I'll try to indicate along the way as we go how we might be able to make headway into some of these questions using this representation of uh, CFT amplitudes. Um, so uh, this Mellon representation, which I'll define very shortly, uh, um, uh, might appear at first sight to be just a change of variables. And in a sense, it is just a change of variables or a change of basis uh, for writing uh, the CFT results. So it might seem like just a trivial uh, uh, thing. So it might seem like a, a somewhat trivial thing. But, uh, but I think uh, change of variables is not something to be sneezed at. It's something uh, uh, that can be very powerful. And let me just give you 
as, phys as theoretical physicists, just two examples that uh, all of you are familiar with. Uh, so the first is just uh, in quantum mechanics. I mean, the, uh, the Schrodinger, or more generally, the direct picture of quantum mechanics uh, clearly helped to unlock many of the, uh, uh, the, the, st the structural properties of uh, quantum mechanics and improved our understanding of quantum mechanics in contrast to the Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, which uh, uh, is equivalent, but is a more cumbersome way of, uh, uh, of viewing it. Uh, another example on a similar vein is uh, about the introduction of the vector potential in electrodynamics, uh, which Maxwell never needed to use for writing down his equation, but we now know that uh, the vector potential is essential for the, uh, for the deeper understanding of the theory, uh, uh, its generalizations, its quantum mechanical manifestation, and so on. So change of variables is not something uh, one should uh, necessarily look down upon. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, th uh, so that's uh, 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 so that's uh, something to just keep in mind. Okay, so let me refresh your memory uh, about uh, uh, amplitudes or correlators in. Uh, in CFT and how sort of we conventionally express them in terms of uh, things called cross ratios. Uh, uh, <coughs> so, um, uh, so in conventional QFT, uh, we also see an example of uh, this change of variables which is useful, uh, namely, uh, amplitudes in momentum space. Uh, uh, our amplitudes in momentum space uh, are, are what we use most of the time as opposed to position space. Uh, so these are more convenient. And let's uh, just recall uh, 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 recall uh, briefly why. Uh, so for one thing, say tree level amplitudes. So if you are doing a but a bit of expansion uh, uh, and you you are considering some arbitrary tree diagram, it could be some endpoint function, but uh, a classical uh, uh, tree level amplitude uh, in momentum space uh, uh, in momentum space are given just by products uh, products of uh, propagators and vertices, uh, no integrals. So, so we don't need to carry out any integrals. The expression is just algebraic and uh, uh, multiplying together the things that the Feynman rules tell you. Uh, um, this is as opposed to position space, uh, um, uh, where uh, in position space, we have a kernel uh, uh, for the two-point function, and you need to uh, 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 is an integral kernel, but uh, uh, but uh, 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 but the propagator in momentum space is is just algebraic, is just uh, so it's essentially because the equations of motion in momentum space are uh, the quadratic equations of motion reduced to algebraic conditions. Um, and so, so that's uh, what, uh, one good thing about uh, uh, amplitudes uh, in momentum space. Um, uh, so, uh, but furthermore, more, more deeply, uh, the, uh, the momentum amplitudes have uh, good analytic properties. So as functions of 
the external momenta uh, have the, they have very attractive analytic properties, uh, and uh, uh, and. Yeah. And these analytic properties have nice physical interpretations. So the poles correspond to stable or unstable particles, uh, uh, single particle states. Uh, there are branch cuts corresponding to, uh, and then there are branch cuts, and they appear very on the real axis, positive real axis, typically, uh, and they correspond to multiparticles. Uh, so we we understand uh, the uh, uh, behavior uh, of uh, uh, these uh, uh, the analytic behavior in a very nice way. The residues at the pole, residues factorize on lower point amplitudes. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, all these sort of uh, 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 nice features uh, uh, are present in momentum space and not in position space where things are, uh, can have very, uh, uh, the, the behavior uh, can be very complicated and highly, and there's no good analyticity. Uh, properties, uh, and uh, and in fact, these uh, analytic properties have a nice translation uh, of uh, various physical uh, properties like locality. Uh, causality and unitarity. Uh, uh, so properties like these are very nicely translated into the analytic behavior there. For instance, uh, locality translates to some kind of boundedness uh, uh, at the infinity of uh, uh, in uh, moment, uh, some kind of polynomial boundedness uh, if you uh, uh, at least theories coming from with a finite number of uh, derivatives uh, 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 have uh, have so, uh, have nice properties uh, uh, and the momentum space amplitudes. Similarly, causality is related to the properties under analytic continuation. Unitarity is related is encoded in various dispersion relations, uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, cutting rules, etc. So, so there are all these very nice properties in momentum space, so that's what makes it uh, uh, the natural language to, uh, uh, to, uh, to adopt. Um, so we can ask, uh, so this is what we do in general conventional quantum field theories, so why can't we do the same in CFTs? Uh, 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 so, so CFTs uh, uh, are of course special. They have uh, additional symmetries, uh, uh, and uh, in particular, well, uh, 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 so let's ask first why we can't do, uh, why we uh, uh, don't want, uh, wouldn't want to sort of use momentum space uh, in CFTs. Uh, so, firstly. Uh, Non-trivial CFTs, that's interacting CFTs uh, on on flat space. If you try to define CFTs on uh, on R, uh, on R, they have a continuous spectrum uh, going down to zero because there's no mass scale in the theory. There's no mass gap. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, and you see this in uh, so two point functions so two point functions go like 
something like one over x square uh, to the delta, so two point function of two uh, uh, primary fields, let's say. So you've probably seen, I'll assume that uh, you've seen a lot of the basics of CFTs in Slava's lectures. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so you know that two point functions uh, behave like this, and if you try to uh, Fourier transform that, it's actually for a general delta, delta need not be an integer uh, in a non-trivial CFT, you get fairly bad analytic behavior, even very naively you can see that it sort of would translate on dimensional grounds to something like this, which has a branch cut going down to zero. Uh, uh, so this has Uh, and, uh, uh, and then it's very difficult to pick out any features. There are no sort of, uh, in this sort of continuous, when you have this scale in red and sort of spectrum, uh, you don't see these sort of poles uh, uh, in, in momentum space in any uh, uh, simple way. You instead see these sort of uh, branch cuts. But more seriously, the uh, the special conformal transformations, which are uh, things that are part, uh, uh, so the way it, they don't act nicely on momentum space. Uh, uh, so we have these additional global symmetry scale invariants as well as uh, these uh, special conformal transformations and they don't act nicely on momentum space. Uh, uh, so, uh, and so it's very, uh, it, so clearly you would like to have a, a formalism or a language in which uh, you, uh, you see the global symmetries manifest. Uh, in, for ordinary QFTs which had just uh, Poincare invariants, that was fine because P square and other uh, Invariants were, uh, were, uh, were invariant, uh, uh, so uh, things like pi dot pj or uh, Mandelstam invariants uh, were invariant under the global symmetries. But now, when you have these additional symmetries, uh, this is not a good uh, 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 momentum space is not uh, uh, very useful. Another way to say it is that, or equivalently, Uh, uh, the theory is best formulated on uh, uh, in sort of radial quantization, as you would have also heard in, uh, in Slava's lecture. There, there it's uh, 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 so the, here the time translation, the generator, the Hamiltonian is the in this radial quantization is the dilatation operator. Uh, and uh, uh, by D, dilatation. And uh, this has a discrete spectrum. Uh, Uh, of dimensions, uh, and so the eigenvalues are the dimensions of the corresponding operators, and this has a dimension, uh, discrete spectrum of uh, dimensions for, at least for d greater than two, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, the uh, conformal field theory is more naturally formulated in, in this sort of uh, global uh, cylinder. This is R. Uh, um, and uh, so here, of course, momenta are not anyway the, the good quantities. Where you would at most label them by some spherical harmonics uh, on, uh, on the sphere. So, so you see that momentum space is anyway not the, uh, uh, the natural quantity. Uh, so that's why 
uh, uh, in CFDs uh, and in things like um, Slava's lectures, uh, uh, the correlators are, uh, uh, are written in position space. So you're back to position space. Uh, uh, and you consider some uh, endpoint function of, uh, uh, of some local operators uh, 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 in position space. Uh, and uh, then you have all the sort of disadvantages of position space. So you're back uh, there, but uh, um, so, the, uh, so the question is, is there another representation Uh, which has the uh, advantages of momentum space in flat space CFT, uh, flat in the usual con uh, quantum field theories. Uh, and, uh, ah, yes, Atish. Sorry, a D equal to two? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in higher dimensions, because essentially this is a sphere with curvature, so that automatically sort of, uh, you get a discreteness in the, this thing, whereas, uh, on the circle, you can have uh, uh, continuous uh, spectrum in, in two dimensions. Uh, so this is the, so the answer is yes. Uh, R phi square. Uh, 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 so, so that's what uh, uh, the goal of these lectures is to show that Mellon space has uh, these properties. And in fact, it's somewhat surprising that this was proposed by only as recently as 2008 uh, uh, by Mac, uh, who is one of the pioneers of conformal field theories. But uh, uh, so this. Uh, uh, the, so this is uh, this has come quite recently, and I think it's still, which is why it is still relatively unexplored. Uh, though there has been uh, there has been se several papers after this, but still, I think the full potential is is yet to be realized. Uh, okay, any questions? Uh, So let me, um, uh, 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 so before we introduce this Mellon space, let's go to these correlators in position space and uh, uh, explain some of their properties. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we look at, uh, uh, so we'll generally look at conformal field theories which have, in addition, uh, which have the special conformal transformation symmetry, which I uh, assume all of you ha have seen. But uh, um, they, of course, have scale invariance. And sometimes, I mean, uh, sometimes I'll, uh, it will be useful uh, 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 to sometimes make a distinction between scale invariance and uh, conformal invariance. Uh, uh, conformal invariance is more restrictive, uh, uh, but sometimes I'll uh, I'll see, I'll, uh, I'll, it will be, I think, uh, illustrative to discuss uh, uh, the constraints imposed by scale invariance and then the additional ones coming from conformal invariance. So I'll just, uh, just to uh, uh, alert you uh, to that, though it may well be that there are no interesting unitary conformal field, uh, no unitary conf uh, quantum field theories which have scale invariance but are not conformally invariant. Uh, no one is almost 
close to a proof of that, but uh, uh, it's still not completely settled. In any case, uh, just at a formal level, it'll be sometimes useful to make this distinction. Uh, so, uh, so I'll consider mostly amplitudes, which are correlation functions uh, of uh, primary operators. So these are what are called primary operators. And again, you've probably seen this. So they are the, uh, 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 they are the, so the, the, the fields or the states in our conformal field theory are labeled by representations which have a sort of a highest weight or lowest weight state, which in, from the point of view of a state, it's annihilated by the special conformal transformations. Uh, uh, and, uh, and these are the primary operators. They are the ones with lowest dimension. And then you act uh, by derivatives, which are the descendants. Uh, so, uh, so these primary operators are labeled by delta i is the dimension and li is the spin, spin or the so d minus uh, so uh, d quantum numbers. Uh, but very often, for simplicity, I'll uh, uh, will will restrict to uh, uh, to scalars, external scalars, uh, uh, Li equal to zero. Uh, I mean, people have developed the formalism more for external uh, uh, states with spin. It's, it's not complete, but there is, uh, yeah, it, it introduces lots of polarization vectors, many things, so I will not uh, uh, go into that. So we'll mostly talk about external scalars. Uh, and uh, very often, uh, I'll focus on, uh, on the four-point function, uh, 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 which is, in a sense, the, the first non-trivial uh, uh, correlator uh, in, in the CFT. Uh, which, is, which has a non-trivial dependence on the positions. Uh, 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 the three-point functions are essentially determined by numbers, uh, uh, the two-point function uh, by the dimension. Uh, so, uh, so the two- and three-point functions have information encoded in a few numbers, uh, but the four-point function is the first one, as we'll see, which has uh, uh, information about positions. Uh, uh, so, uh, so what can we say about these correlators in a CFT? Uh, firstly, by Poincaré invariance, uh, A of x i can only depend on xij square, which is xi minus xj square. Uh, this is the translational invariance, tells you it can depend only on differences. And rotational invariance tells you it can depend only on, uh, uh, I mean, rotation or Lorentz invariance tells you it can only depend on, uh, on the squares. Of course, if there are uh, spins, then there would be external factors which can depend on xi minus xj to with various tensor indices corresponding to these spins, but those will be some sort of overall factors, and as I said, I'll not mostly consider those. Uh, so we'll consider something that depends uh, only on, uh, on these xij square. Uh, now, scale invariance Scale invariance uh, is the statement that O of lambda xi, that these primaries, uh, they transform in a a homogeneous way under the scaling uh, uh, with uh, 
the dimension being the uh, power of the homogeneity. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, so under this, uh, so xij square, of course, we go to lambda square xij square. Uh, uh, so things can't depend purely on xij square. Uh, so a of xi. Uh, so first, okay. So uh, so a of so the amplitude, if you scale up all the coordinates, is because each of the individual ones uh, uh, scales this way. Uh, the amplitude scales as. Uh, 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 as just uh, uh, sum of all the powers uh, 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 of, uh, 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 so it just comes out uh, as an overall factor like that. Uh, so since xij square scale like this, we can define, of course, the usual ratios. So xij squared divided by some xkl square uh, is invariant uh, uh, under, uh, under this rescaling. Uh, so, so if you just had scale invariants, you would say that uh, a of xi, you could write as Uh, you could write as, uh, you could take out, so of course it depends on, uh, on these, so you, 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 you take out a factor of these xij square raised to some powers, uh, delta ij, where uh, uh, delta ij are chosen uh, such that sum over i and j, these are of course symmetric, uh, uh, so I, could, I should really write i less than j, but in any case, uh, uh, I guess this twice this uh, uh, is equal to uh, delta i because we know that each of the xij square uh, 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 transform like this, so this whole factor transforms uh, as, uh, uh, with a factor of lambda to this power. Uh, uh, so you can ma you choose the delta ij uh, to uh, such that uh, 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 such that this is equal to the sum over the delta i's uh, uh, because you're you're writing it in terms of that times a reduced amplitude, which depends only on ratio. So rij are independent set of independent ratios, uh, and uh, 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 so uh, we can take them to be uh, example. So the Rij uh, are a set of independent ratios, uh, which you can take to be, for instance, Xij square divided by say x12 square, uh, 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 and uh, uh, where I j is not equal to uh, uh, 1, 2. So you take these ratios. These are all independent because you can make any other ratio uh, uh, from these. So, so it's easy to count how many of them are there. Basically, the xij's, there are n into n minus 1 by 2 of them. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you're not including the 1, 2. So there are, so, so there are n into n minus 1 by 2 minus 1 of these ratios. So, so in terms of uh, some, uh, so you have some freedom in choosing what these ratios are. Uh, so you uh, uh, choose them to be anything uh, which is convenient to you like this. Uh, uh, you can write the whole amplitude as a function of these ratios times an overall factor, where here these delta ij's 
Uh, also, you have some freedom, so some arbitrariness is there. So the arbitrariness in the choice, because these delta ij's, again, there are essentially n into n minus 1 by two of them, uh, and you are just imposing one condition. So there's some, uh, there's a lot of arbitrariness in the choice. Sorry, this is below people's horizon. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try not to write over here. So, uh, so this arbitrariness in this choice uh, uh, is just, can be absorbed into uh, your A tilde, because the, if, you if you choose a different set of delta ij's, but also satisfying this, uh, the difference will be just appearing in terms of some, uh, it just involves changing the function A tilde. So that's quite trivial. So this is what scale invariance tells you. Uh, but now you also have conformal invariance. Uh, um, or special conformal invariance. Uh, I'll take a shortcut uh, in talking about the special conformal invariance uh, by using the fact that very often the special conformal invariance uh, uh, comes from uh, the presence uh, of an inversion symmetry. Uh, basically, you define xi prime mu is equal to xi mu divided by xi squared. This is the inversion transformation. Uh, 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 and uh, the special conformal invariance, the k mu generator, if you wish, can be viewed as uh, so if the i is this inversion symmetry, then the special conformal transformation is really a composition of an inversion, uh, a translation, and an inversion back again. Maybe you have seen this uh, in some of your lectures. In any case, uh, 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 that's a simple way to define, uh, to sort of obtain the special conformal transformations. If you haven't seen it, uh, you should... Uh, uh, yeah, you should work that out uh, uh, and see that you get exactly the uh, uh, the form that uh, uh, of special conformal transformations that you normally uh, have. So, so but it's often more convenient to work with this inversion symmetry, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so under this inversion symmetry, uh, the primary operators. Uh, 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 under this inversion, essentially transform uh, by a factor uh, of uh, by a factor of this. Uh, uh, so it's almost as if you can think of this as a local scale factor, and this is the kind of uh, scaling. So you see, if you replace lambda by 1 over x square, then uh, uh, it's the same sort of transformation. This is the general rule for uh, the transformation under a, uh, for a primary under, uh, 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 for a primary field under the, uh, uh, under any vile transformation. Uh, 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 if you'd consider non-primaries, the the transformation can be more complicated, but uh, you can work it out from the uh, the basic one for the primaries. So, um, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, so if you have this as the uh, uh, transformation law under uh, inversion, the whole amplitude, the a of x i uh, that we, we defined over there. Uh, so if I consider inverting, if I invert all the coordinates, uh, then what I get uh, 
uh, is um, a factor of xi squared to the power delta i uh, 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 for each i. Uh, uh, so if or, uh, uh, for the endpoint function, I get an overall factor like this, which depends on the individual x's. So this is a more constraining condition on the form of the, <coughs> the more constraining condition on the form of the uh, uh, correlator. Uh, what does it uh, do for us? Uh, uh, so, uh, so just like we saw under the scale transformation, how uh, uh, xij square, which is what things can depend on, uh, transform. Uh, there it was very simple homogeneous transformation. But here, under this inversion, uh, xij square, it's a little bit of algebra to just check, uh, that it transforms to xij square divided by xi square xj square. Uh, so that's a little, just a small algebraic exercise, which if you haven't seen before, you can usually just uh, uh, check, so this is very convenient uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, 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 a way to write it. Uh, uh, so, uh, so under this inversion, you have things like this. Uh, this transformation uh, transforms like this. So clearly ratios, which were scale invariant like this one, are not necessarily, are not in general invariant uh, under this uh, uh, transformation. So you can ask, whenever you have a symmetry, it's useful to write down the things which are invariant under the symmetry. So you want to construct things uh, which are invariant. And so these are the so-called the cross ratios, which are not just ratios, but uh, so, you can see that if I define xij square, xkl square, and then let's say xi, ik square, xjl square, uh, and so that's why it's called cross, because I'm just crossing uh, the ratio xij square by, uh, 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 so it's, I'm taking sort of a, a mutation of the indices. So these are invariant under inversion that's almost obvious right because xij square will pick up a factor of xi square xj square and the denominator xkl square will pick up a xk square xl square and here you see you have the same indices i k j l uh, so you'll pick up the same factor uh, and the downstairs as well so they'll cancel and so the whole thing is invariant Right, so uh, uh, so this is invariant under inversion, and therefore uh, uh, special conformal transformations. Uh, uh, so so the, it, things must depend uh, uh, apart from an overall factor now on not these cross ratios, but uh, now not on ratios, but on these cross ratios. Uh, and so how many such cross ratios are there? Uh, for an endpoint function, there are n into n minus three by two. So let's quickly prove that. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that's uh, often stated, but it's very simple to, uh, to, uh, to just show this uh, uh, number. So you see there are fewer than the ratios. The ratios there were n into n minus one by two minus one. Uh, uh, so there are n into n minus three by two independent cross ratios. Uh, for endpoints. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just very quickly just sketch it. Uh, 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 so supposing we have, if we have a, a set uh, of independent cross ratios, so the, uh, for n minus one points, 
Supposing someone gave you a set uh, of cross ratios uh, uh, for n minus one points, uh, uh, we just do this recursively, uh, uh, whatever, inductively. Uh, 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 so we want to now consider, uh, and we add the point xn. Uh, we want to consider the independent cross ratios for this, uh, and now the set of endpoints. Uh, uh, so we already have cross ratios involving all the, uh, these are, the set uh, is, uh, uh, let me, um, let me call the cross ratio C. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so we have some, uh, uh, set involving all the x1 for, this is for the points x1 up to xn minus 1. Uh, and these are the various independent cross ratios uh, uh, that you have formed over here. Now we add an xn. Um, uh, uh, so we can uh, construct new cross ratios involving xn, so the new cross ratios must involve the point n, uh, the xn, so we can construct them, for example, like this. Uh, so I, where a is, goes from three up to n minus one. So, uh, so you have taking the point three, uh, the distance is from uh, three to n minus one uh, 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 to n are in this x a n square, as then the x two n square in the denominator. So you've taken into account the positions from two to n and from a to n, uh, from three to, uh, uh, three onwards all the way uh, up to n. So these are, uh, these are all independent cross ratios that you can add. They're all of this form. Uh, so they're all cross ratios. And there are n minus two of them. So there are n minus, uh, sorry, n minus three of them. Uh, Uh, so there are n minus three of them, and then you can, uh, but uh, we, we see that what's missing is x1n in this, so we just have to add also, add something which involves x1n, and you can uh, uh, do that by just considering another cross ratio involving x1n, like x1 r. Uh, uh, something like that. Uh, uh, so you have involved x1n as well, uh, and uh, so uh, so you've built independent cross ratios involving all the uh, the new uh, set of xn's. And how many of them are there? You've added n minus two of them. Uh, uh, so if uh, if s n minus one were the number of independent cross ratios for n points, n minus one points, then what we have is is a recursion relation like this because you have n minus three uh, uh, plus. Um, uh, one, so there are n minus two additional ones. So, uh, and then all you need to know is, uh, let's say that uh, for four points, you have two independent cross ratios, which will be important to us. So let me uh, write them down. Conventionally, they are chosen to be U and V, which is, I hope I'm keeping to the same convention as was used in the bootstrap lectures. 
so, uh, so for uh, four points, that's the first non-trivial case where you have any uh, cross ratio, uh, 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 any non-trivial uh, uh, cross ratio. Uh, and in fact, so this tells you that Sn is n into n minus 3 by 2. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we have all these cross ratios, which are fewer in number than what a general theory uh, could depend on. So, so coming back to our question of what is an amplitude that will uh, satisfy this, we can write that A of xi is of the form like before, xij square to some power delta ij times a reduced amplitude, which depend only on these cross ratios CNs. Uh, CNs are the set of all these. Uh, so, uh, so these are all the set of cross ratios, independent cross ratios, uh, uh, which we wrote down over here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we, we, uh, we write it in a similar form uh, like over here, except that we again have this delta ij is uh, this overall factor which must take into account this covariance of the transformation. So the amplitude is not invariant. If it were invariant, we would write it, build it purely out of the cross ratios, but it's covariant. And, uh, uh, and to take into account the covariance, uh, uh, we have this additional factor. Uh, and using the fact that xij square transform under inversion in this way, uh, we have delta ij chosen so that sum over, sum over j delta ij, so j of course is not equal to i, uh, so this is summed only over the index j, this is equal to delta i, uh, uh, or two delta i, Sorry, no, just delta i, because uh, it transforms as xi square uh, uh, to the delta i. Uh, um, so, uh, so you see each of these xi j squared, it, 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 we, we, need to, we need to get an overall factor of xi square for each i raised to the power delta i. Um, and uh, 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 so, so each of these xi, so all the ones which have and i in them will get a factor of xi square raised to the power, the corresponding delta ij. So you sum over all the j's, and that total power should be equal to delta i. So these are n constraints. So these are for each i equal to 1 to n. So now the delta ij are more restricted. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but there's some arbitrariness again. But that can be absorbed. Uh, into, so you're free to choose uh, something and the rest of it, I mean, you can absorb it into, the, because the uh, uh, two different choices will just depend on cross ratios as you can convince yourself. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so you can choose a canonical set of the delta ij's such that they obey this, uh, 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 these conditions, but nothing else. Uh, so there are only n conditions on the n into n minus one by two delta ij's. Uh, so you you have uh, uh, quite a lot of freedom, and uh, uh, you choose it in a way that uh, this is satisfied. And then everything depends only on this reduced amplitude. So it's a much bigger simplification uh, uh, compared to a uh, compared to a general Poincaré invariant theory because everything is now essentially in this function. 
which depends on far fewer variables than uh, uh, you would have expected in a general uh, Poincaré invariant field theory where things could depend on n into n minus 1 by 2 of these uh, xig squares. Uh, uh, but things here depend only on n into n minus is a function that depends only on n into n minus 3 by 2 uh, uh, variables. So, uh, uh, so for example, n equal to, so that's uh, uh, the reason why uh, the two and three point functions are in a sense trivial, uh, no cross ratios there, uh, uh, they don't have any interesting functional dependence. Uh, uh, for, um, four, for four points, you have one function of, uh, four point function uh, depends non-trivially on these two variables, u and v, uh, and uh, uh, whereas a general four-point function would have depended on four into three by two, six variables, but here it's just two variables, so it's a vast simplification. Uh, 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 in a scale invariant theory, it would have still depended on five variables, so special conformal invariance really gets you quite a lot of mileage. Uh, you have things which depend on much fewer uh, uh, variables. Any questions? Uh, then the number of points uh, uh, you're saying, uh, yeah. So in general, if you're in, okay, I'm ignoring the fact that in, in just, some- Can you repeat the questions? Can you repeat uh, He was, I think, asking that uh, the dependence grows quadratically in the number of points, uh, the dependence of the functional dependence. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so, of course, uh, so in general, if uh, that would be the case, in special dimensions, there can be additional relations because if you are in two dimensions, for instance, then these two are not independent. They are sort of complex conjugates, or you can form complex conjugates out of them because they are all forced to lie on a plane. So there are linear relations between the vectors. Uh, and so in higher dimensions, there'll be some more complicated constraints. Uh, uh, but typically, that's uh, the, the functional dependence. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, those additional accidents, those are sort of accidents that depend on particular dimension. The functional dependence is sort of more uniform, so you can, uh, indeed it does depend on, in general, on these, uh, on these, uh, all these quantities. In any case, in four dimensions, these are, for instance, these are genuinely independent cross ratios for the four point function. In three dimensions, yeah. In two dimensions, you get, uh, this, uh, they are essentially complex conjugates. Uh, we can. Rajesh, we, we directly go to the question session. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I, I didn't uh, realize yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's already an hour. Any other question? Uh, okay. Okay, so let's thank Rajesh for. His...